Hello, everybody, and welcome to the uh, latest uh, restorative justice webinar on the new Jim Crow uh, and uh, the intersections it has with restorative justice. Uh, this is going to be a very exciting and important uh, conversation today. Um, and I'll just do a little bit of an introduction of myself and talk about um, how to participate in this webinar. Uh, and then I'll turn things over to Howard. Um, my name is Brian Gum, and I'm the distance learning technology analyst for Eastern Mennonite University. And I help facilitate the technology for these uh, restorative justice webinars. Um, I am also a former student of Howard's uh, at the Center for Justice and Peace Building at EMU. And um, I am currently teaching a course in restorative justice at, um, at Grinnell College in Iowa. And so uh, some of my special guests here are students of mine today, so I'm excited to have them here as well. Um, and uh, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about how participants in this can participate in the conversation throughout the course of this webinar. Um, if uh, folks watching look down in the bottom right hand corner of the WebEx window, there is a chat box that's visible there. Um, and uh, if you uh, put your mouse cursor in the little uh, area where it says type of chat, uh, chat message in, um, you can uh, communicate via text to various people in the <laughs> webinar. And so we have uh, Sarah Rothshank is kind of taking questions from everybody throughout the course of the webinar. And she's collecting those questions as the conversation proceeds. So you can type them in at any time. And uh, if you send them directly to Sarah, um, she will collect those and at various points, get those over to Howard. And Howard can interject those uh, questions back into the conversation. So that's how, um, though you can't speak and, uh, and, and we can't see you or hear you, you can still be a part of the conversation. We very much welcome participation um, on this topic today. So I'll go ahead and turn things over to Howard and uh, you can take it from there. Thanks everybody. Thanks Brian. And I'll add my welcome uh, to those of you who've joined us today. Uh, this really is an important topic, I think. The, Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, has really brought a very profound and exciting attention to the issue of mass incarceration, and not just mass incarceration, but the latent consequences of it, some of the some of the uh, less explicit consequences of it, the issues around race and power, especially. And I think these two issues, race and power, are some of the most critical issues facing not just our country, but restorative justice as a field. I just don't think we've dealt with them in the field, and I think we have to. Uh, someone asked me for a blurb about a consultation that's coming up on the topic today, and I said, I wrote to him, I said, the issues of race and power are some of the most critical issues facing the restorative justice movement today. If we don't address these, we are bound to perpetuate the devastating pattern of inequality and oppression that, that uh, we criticize in the institutions that we seek to transform. Well, those our three guests today are going to be addressing these issues, and I'm very excited about that. And uh, it's also the first time I think we have tried to have this kind of conversation with this many people. So we'll see how that all goes. The uh, moderator of the conversation is going to be Jacqueline Robeck Sacco. I'll say a few things about Jacqueline. Uh, she's pursuing a professional doctorate in educational leadership at Duquesne University. She's a Heinz Fellow there. She's specifically examining racially inequitable discipline practices in schools through a social justice lens. She's seeking to address how race is involved with disciplinary with discipline practices and the role of educational leaders play in racial disparity. She consults with a variety of community, as she says, community-centric organizations. Uh, she has quite a background in facilitated dialogue, program development, and that kind of thing. Um, She's really interested and been working at the development of transformative tools for community-based organizations and organizers who are serving vulnerable communities. Uh, the best part, though, is that she's a CJP graduate, uh, <laughs> and uh, my wife and I consider her a, a good personal friend. So I'm really pleased to have you here, Jacqueline, and I'm going to let you, and I should have had that introductory 
slide, but I was to drop the ball on that. Uh, I'm going to let you introduce the other two uh, people. So I uh, will turn it over to you, Jacqueline. Okay, let me see how to get. There you are. Okay. Hey, Howard. Hey. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, so my two guests that, or my two folks that work in this field and work um, looking at race and how it intersects in education, how it intersects in, intersects with law, um, two folks that I'm very um, honored to be with today. Uh, the first is Nakima Levy Towns, and Nakima is a professor of law at the University of St. Thomas, um, but she also is the director of a civil rights legal clinic that they have there, which um, I think is profound. And they do a lot of community work. And when I say community work or community centered work, they really place the, the needs of the community at the center of what they do. So you can find Nakima inside of school board meetings. You can find her inside of schools. You can find her, um, you know, typically places that you may not think um, law professors would go. Uh, but that's the work that she does, and I really enjoy the way that she does that work. Um, and she was also a part of a gathering that we had in 2009 of um, African Americans who were involved in some way with restorative justice, even if that's not what they were naming it, but the work itself in dialogue and inviting people to conversation to have really crucial conversations um, is what we were kind of looking at, and that's where we first met. Our other panelist um, is She Desai, and I met She at the 2013 Critical Race and Education Conference. And what I was blown away about is this idea that restorative justice really is um, a process that crosses disciplines. So she um, teaches, he's an assistant professor at Thomas More College in Kentucky. Um, and his background is in critical social justice as an educator. He's been doing that for 15 years. Um, and he works with teacher preparation um, at Thomas More. Uh, but what really interests me with she is the way that he talked about dialogue is exactly the way we discuss dialogue and restorative justice. And I really look forward to an opportunity to work with him um, and have a conversation with him. And here we are. Um, now, he, his interest in how he looks at teacher preparation and dealing with youth and uh, youth leadership is through critical justice in education. He also deals with hip hop pedagogy and critical literacy and critical race theory, um, which again are all crucial theories that kind of um, we don't necessarily find a conversation with restorative justice. So those are, we are the guests, we are the folks having the conversation with the rest of you today. Did you want to start, Jackie? Oh, yeah. I thought that we were, um, I thought that the mic or something was wrong with it. I apologize. Thank you, Sheila. <laughs> okay, so originally, um, when we started planning for this webinar, we wanted to take a case study and kind of um, use critical race uh, theory allows you to create narratives. And we had kind of worked together to put a narrative together to start everyone off. But we would really enjoy now um, on the heels of the Jordan Davis uh, trial to um, kind of reflect on that and use that as our pivotal point around this conversation. So this slide here um, is very interesting. So at the top left corner, we have Trayvon Martin. Um, of course, the, the big case of Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman in that case again in Florida. And I really like this sign here, so we are all Trayvon Martin. So when we talk about the New Jim Crow, when we talk about mass incarceration, 
um, after Trayvon Martin was killed, you saw a number of folks, even celebrities, a high profile. You had the Miami, the Miami Heat team. Everyone kind of walked around for a while wearing hoodies. Um, so just to indicate that we can all be Trayvon at any time. Underneath Trayvon is Renisha McBride. So Renisha McBride had some car trouble um, in Michigan um, and went to a house to ask for help. And somehow within a conversation that happened in that, she ended up being shot um, in her face, I believe, uh, and killed uh, that night. Uh, down below, Renisha is Jordan Davis. And I love this picture because he's wearing this hat, which is like um, kind of like a, I want to say it's a cultural hip hop thing. You see the youth sometimes wearing this brand of Obey. And so when we think about Obey in terms of critical race and education, I think that um, Jordan with this hat on is very significant uh, in this slide. And Jordan um, just again was apparently in his car listening to hip hop. Uh, it was very loud to the other person who killed him um, and his life was uh, taken just like that. Now up in the right hand corner, we have Emmett Till. And the reason why we have Emmett Till here is because we really want to show this legacy of how Black youth um, are disposable. And so, you know, and what are we doing about that? How are we having conversations about it? And if things, when things like this happen within a restorative justice framework, if there's a victim and the person, the offender, we look at, you know, how do we come together? But this is more of an issue where we're looking at a systemic harm. And so the big question around um, the pioneer movement of restorative justice is how will restorative justice be able to address um, systemic issues? And the picture here below, again, is this youth who has been detained and just looking at the wall, it's, it's almost like you're looking at him and you're looking at him in the cell and he's just really out of place. Like, how does he fit in? Um, and so that kind of leads us into this discussion. And with the next slide, then we'll just open up our conversation um, and my colleagues can jump in. And then Akima, you may want to start us off here um, because I thought that this was cool um, and really explain to us um, what this means. Well, I think one of the things that is important for us to understand when we're talking about restorative justice, when we're talking about the disposability of the Black body, is that the issues that we see happening within our public education system and happening within the criminal justice system are really just a manifestation of our unreconciled racial history in America. Somehow we've arrived at the place where in which we feel that we have reached a post-racial society. And those of us who have to deal with inequality and um, inequity on a regular basis as a result of our race, we recognize that we are very far from living in a post-racial society. So if you look at what's currently happening in America, um, we have now over 2 million people who are incarcerated and over 7 million people under some form of correctional supervision or control. What we need to understand is that that did not happen by accident. Um, even going back to the 13th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, uh, which abolished slavery in 1865, and essentially, I'm paraphrasing, but the 13th Amendment says that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall be allowed except if one has been duly convicted of a crime. So that language may seem benign or neutral, but the reality is that um, after the 13th Amendment to the Constitution was enacted, we had tremendous changes that happened in the South. So laws and policies were changed that made standard and enacted that made uh, standard behavior by Black men a crime. So if a Black man was um, hanging out late at night, spitting on the sidewalk, talking too loud, unemployed, that was enough for a Southern sheriff to scoop him up. He'd be brought into the criminal justice system 
likely tried before an all-white jury, likely found guilty and sentenced to work on a chain gang, and the state would profit from this inmate labor because the men would be sentenced to very lengthy sentences, 10, 20 years in prison, having to work in unsanitary conditions, and farms, corporations, and landowners would pay the state um, for this inmate labor. So in some ways, it was an extension of our system of slavery, but through the use of the criminal justice system. Um, a book that documents this history is called Slavery by Another Name, uh, which really does a good job of helping us to understand the ways in which laws and policies in some ways perpetuate this system of racial injustice and slavery. Um, and, and as we know, Michelle Alexander also talks about some of these issues in her book, The New Jim Crow. So if you fast forward to 1980, we had about 500,000 people who were incarcerated in the United States. In the mid-1980s, we started with the war on drugs, which resulted in tens of thousands of nonviolent, low-level offenders being brought into the criminal justice system. And a disproportionate number of these people were African-American and Latino. The reason that this is important is because if you look historically at um, income inequality, access to opportunity, and access to education, we essentially took those who lived on the fringes of society, who were not uh, typically engaged in our mainstream economy, and who, who had developed underground systems to survive, such as, let's say, low-level drug trafficking, for example. Rather than dealing with the income inequality, we decided to get tough on crime and enact really harsh penalties for those who were caught trafficking drugs or in possession of drugs. So in other words, we hyper-criminalized the poor, and in particular, poor men of color, as well as women and children. That notion of getting tough on crime has trickled into our school system, such that we have situations in which standard behavior by children, adolescent behavior, um, low-level um, activity is suddenly hyper-criminalized, and children, rather than being sent to the principal's office, let's say for talking back to a teacher or getting into a fight, now we have a situation in which those children might actually be arrested, be led away um, from campus in handcuffs, and really have to deal with the juvenile and, in some cases, adult criminal justice system for, in many cases, typical adolescent behavior. And that's the problem that we're faced with right now. We need to understand this did not just happen in a vacuum. It's very much connected to history and the way we use laws, power, and influence to control those who are marginalized. Thank you, um, Nikina, that was powerful. Um, and so when we're thinking about back to the other slide with the three youth who were killed, so we know that all three youth were killed by uh, white folks, both um, in men, on all men. Um, and then Emmett Till um, was more of a gang kind of uh, the time that he was killed and allowed it to be more of a more people involved than just, you know, it was self-defense or something like that because it, it has some historical um, precedence with it. And then we see the youth here um, and we wonder how does this happen? So we talk about this school to prison pipeline. And when we start at the mouth of the pipeline, which is what I hear you talking about, Nikima, we're in the school and we are now criminalizing developmental behavior that occurs in school. Um, and so, she, I want to speak to you, or I would like for you to speak to the idea of when you're talking about teacher preparation, um, it, it's, it's been my experience uh, that we, and when I say we, I mean the system of education, the organization of education, are not doing a thorough enough job in our preparation process of teachers, and also, uh, I'm not quite sure the organization of education has fully themselves as an organization dealt with their systemic issues of race and power. Um, this topic is very interesting because uh, I just did a presentation recently at Loyola University on uh, a 
project that I did with some of the students here on Thomas More. And the purpose of the project was to use the Trayvon Martin case as a way to examine um, implicit biases. And so there is a huge literature and a lot of research that's been conducted over the years that talks about um, social con cognition and implicit biases and how, you know, regardless of our race or class or gender, we all have implicit biases. And as a matter of fact, uh, I think it's called Project Implicit, and it's a collaboration between um, three or four different universities. And what they do is they have these online um, tests that you can take. They examine various things, everything from race to the treatment of post uh, of, of Muslim slash Arab Americans post 9/11 to gender to age uh, and so forth. And what these tests consistently find is that over and over again, uh, folks who take these tests demonstrate an implicit bias towards a group. And so how does this relate to uh, teacher education? Um, one of the things um, that I found in the, in the research, and I'm sure Nakima can talk about this as well, is you know even when we do uh, studies with police officers and they do like simulations, on, you know they're more likely to shoot at an African American male even when that male does not have a weapon. Uh, but a harmless object, and, and they've done these tests over and over. And so, how does that translate through uh, education? Um, one of the things I talk about is um, a disciplinary gaze that's occurring at our schools. And so, a lot of educators will say the reason why we have this problem of uh, of overrepresentation of Black and Brown youth um, facing suspension of um, being expelled or is general school disciplines because of cultural differences. Or they come mm -hmm. into school speaking a different language or a different dialect. They have different cultures. Um, other folks talk about cultural participation, uh, meaning that in order for education to truly prosper, the teacher and the student need to be in sync and their cultures need to be in sync. And the reason why I like the word disciplinary gaze because it comes from the idea of criminogenic gaze, where when we view particularly men of color, um, we view them through a lens of, of criminality. And so, so much so that um, the kids as young as three associate black being good and white being bad. And so if these are the implicit biases that are being honed in over the years, how do teachers um, view black and brown youth? And so we did a project where we looked at different cases of racial profiling. Um, a couple of examples would be Wilson Reyes was a uh, seven-year-old in South Bronx who was arrested uh, for allegedly bullying uh, one of his classmates. And uh, he was held for like several hours in a, in a precinct uh, because, you know, his mom couldn't get out of work. And I talked to the students, you know, what, what do you think is the job of the teacher? You know, should that have occurred in the first place? And what I talked to the students about it is the, this idea of like stepping in when um, when a child needs an advocate the most. Like Wilson Reyes needed an advocate uh, because there was no one there for him to advocate for him and to actually stop the police from taking him and arresting him. Uh, as far as I was concerned, if there is a bullying um, incident, then the school should handle it first rather than the police uh, get involved right away. Another example I shared with the students was uh, of Alvin, and uh, he, <clears throat> he was brought to the media's attention because he was one of the first, uh, he was stopped and frisked youth in New York that actually reported the experience of being stopped and frisked in New York City. And while you hear the audio tape, you hear how the police uh, belittle him, use uh, profanity and demeaning language against him. And so if, if this is what our youth are facing outside of school, um, imagine how they feel once they enter the school and rather than seeing just a teacher, they see someone in authority and the experiences they have of people in authority are people who don't view them as humans, uh, who dehumanize them. And, uh, you know, cases like Jordan Davis, Trayvon Martin, uh, Anisha McBride, um, and several other cases over the last few years, um, it's reinforced that. And so what the type of work I do with the teach uh, with my teacher candidates is just talking about, you know, how do we become more aware of these implicit biases and how do we 
um, use these intensifiers, biases to fight against um, social injustice. And I think what I wanted to add about this conversation was when we talk about restorative justice, right? And we talk about you know to right the wrongs and the harm that has done, uh, that has been done. We talked about yesterday or the day before. Um, obviously, the justice system thus far has not uh, produced the verdicts that we expected. And so, uh, rather than relying on the justice system, maybe we use a justice, uh, I'm sorry, restorative justice forum to engage in a truth and reconcil uh, reconciliation process where we can articulate the harm that's being done. Um, and just basically going back to uh, critical race theory, tell our stories. And I think that's what's missing right now is that we constantly feel over and over again that our stories aren't being told and that our bodies are disposable and that our um, you know, people in our community are basically just targeted for violence. Thank you, Steve, and I agree. Um, and when stories are told, uh, oftentimes they're explained away by um, the notions that you brought up. Uh, when you think about the deficit thinking paradigm and that uh, students of color uh, come into the school at a deficit, culturally, socially, economically, and therefore um, what is the system and the organization of education supposed to do? This is a cultural issue. Um, so it's very significant to be able to tie together um, that n necessarily, even if this is a cultural issue, one thing that we know for sure in the literature and in the research in the organization of education is that poor, hungry, homeless, abused kids can learn. Right. So that we know. <laughs> we may not, you know, have all the other data clear, but that much we know. So. Um, yeah, so when we think about restorative justice in terms of being um, an approach that can address systemic issues, again, that is a passion that I have because I feel like restorative justice can do just that. I feel like mm -hmm. restorative justice practitioners, um, the team, and I hear you saying, mm -hmm, uh, practitioners can really begin to utilize this, uh, what Howard often calls an invitation to dialogue at its most basic principle. Restorative justice is an invitation to dialogue. So, um, Nakima, since you had the uh -huh, the amen, I'll let you chime in and talk about how you see restorative justice being um, an approach that can respond to a systemic issue. So, not a one person or a community that has harmed one person or another community, but a system of harm that has impacted an entire community. Well, Jacqueline, I think you're absolutely right. And I also um, appreciate Sheev's comments as well. Uh, here in Minnesota, we have dealt with a variety of issues in terms of trying to bridge the gap between the knowledge that teachers have about kids of color who enter the school system in, and enter their classrooms um, and the impacts that that lack of knowledge has on how they are treated within the school system and how easy it is to take a punitive approach to kids who are actually in need um, of additional supports as opposed to, less, to fewer supports. So one of the things that we have set out to do um, has been to encourage our local public schools to adopt restorative justice in terms of how they deal with punishing uh, young people. And even in terms of uh, the need to use restorative justice to bridge the gap by, as you said, inviting people to dialogue. So often assumptions are made about these young people, especially if they're wearing a hoodie like Trayvon Martin was wearing, or they have music playing loud, or their pants are sagging. And people make assumptions about their um, likelihood of becoming positive, contributing members of society when they look a certain way, when they dress a certain way, when they talk a certain way. And so if you're able to bring in a restorative justice approach into a school setting, it's a way of actually allowing people to be honest about their different perspectives, the impacts of any harm that's been caused within the community, as well as opportunities to not only restore the community as a whole, but also the individual um, who may have been harmed, and in some cases, the individual who may have done the harm. Um, because oftentimes hurt people hurt people. 
<laughs> and if we're taking a punitive approach when a child acts out in a certain way, we never get to the root of what caused um, that child's particular behavior. And restorative justice offers an opportunity for us to, to dig a little bit deeper, to get to the root, and to take a more holistic approach to addressing issues that impact children. And so some of our local, um, so there's a legal rights center that has been partnering with the Minneapolis public school system to incorporate a restorative justice model for, for school discipline, and they're having amazing results. Um, additionally, last spring, I represented two young men, both were African American. They attended a school that was predominantly white, and um, members of the ski team at that particular school dressed in ghetto, ghettoized attire for what they called Ghetto Spirit Day. And instead of the young men who dressed inappropriately being held accountable, uh, my clients were actually. Um, uh, uh, led in a way, one was actually handcuffed on campus, and they were both given citations uh, to appear in court and charged with uh, petty misdemeanor. And so, um, so I got involved along with community members and advocating on behalf of these young men. And part of our strategy was appearing before the school board and really framing the issue, not only around what happened to these two young men um, in question, but also in terms of the disproportionate rate of suspensions, expulsions, administrative transfers, and arrests of students of color within that school system. So we use the incident with the two boys as an opportunity to um, flush out some of the larger issues, but then also to invite the, the school administrators into a restorative justice circle with the young men, where they would have an opportunity to explain why they were upset about this Ghetto Spirit Day incident, um, and then why they wound up um, going back to retrieve posters, which is why they wound up being um, being arrested, simply, you know, going into the vice principal's office and getting posters that they had had made, um, asserting their dignity and you know their sense of humanity as African Americans. So it was really, a, from my perspective, a very twisted situation. But restorative justice offered us all an opportunity to come together and to talk about the historical um, impacts that um, affected not only the behavior of the white ski team, but also the concerns that the young men had um, and a way to resolve the, the issues um, in a way that would preserve the dignity of the young men in this situation. So that was a very powerful example that I've personally been involved in. Yeah, um, and then she. I want to um, bring that bring a discussion that you that the both of us had, um, and we were talking about this idea of restorative justice and being in conversation. And one of the things you said to me was, if we are in conversation and we're in the community, we're local, we're on the ground, we're having the conversation. There's the issue of power. So how does that conversation actually move beyond um, the community voicing their concerns and move into a position where it is impacting power? And then the other piece is that after we had that conversation, you um, talked about taking restorative justice into um, your class with your teachers. And I wanted you to just kind of talk a little bit about that because what we concluded was that once you have a process going on, and that's a restorative justice process, and you have the folks in there in circle and they've come to um, some resolve, the next level could be that the practitioners, the RJ practitioners, then help self-selected folks within that circle from the community um, take it to the next level so that they can then address systemic issues. Okay. Um. So one of the things um, I believe we might have talked about was, so what does it look like in the classroom, right? Um, so while I didn't necessarily do quote unquote restorative justice, um, what I did do was use uh, participatory action research. And one of the things that we kind of end up doing in education is that we don't allow students to address the real issues that are affecting them. Like we're so worried about the common core, which is the new set of standards that 
48 states have uh, adopted over the last two years um, that we don't focus on the, the, the real issues that are affecting us. And so one of what did I do? Sorry, what I did was I used the classroom as an opportunity to help the kids engage in research. Uh, and what do I mean by research? Well, um, I taught at a uh, charter high school, and I know charter schools are highly political, but I want to assure you that the charter school I, I taught at, um, and we didn't get funding from any major foundations. We weren't um, part of a national core of charter schools. It was just a school that, that was founded on the principle that we wanted to work with students who were quote unquote alternative students, uh, students who were uh, suspended, expelled from their local school districts, uh, students who were incarcerated, uh, basically students who were, who were looking for a way to engage back in school and still graduate. And so knowing that that was my population, right? knowing that half of my kids, I would say 60% of my kids were incarcerated, 60% um, um, of them, 75% of them were involved in them, not necessarily a gang member, but 100% of them knew a gang member. Uh, we, our area was had about 30 gangs in that neighborhood. And so rather than ignoring this big issue of incarceration of gangs, you know, let's research it. Let's let's get uh, let's learn about critical theory. So I taught my students critical race theory. I taught them critical pedagogy. I taught them, uh, you know, womanism, which is a branch of critical feminism. Uh, I taught them anti-colonial theory. So now that you had a theory, let's talk about, well, how do these theories help explain what's occurring? And so I had my students do field, uh, field work where they went out to the community and wrote field notes on like how they saw gang activity. Um, and how did they, I had them interview folks. Um, and they talked about like how the gangs impact them and actually interview gang members. Talked to them about like how to, why did they decide to join gangs? And so through this process, what ends up happening is that you empower kids, right? Um, and you give them the power to make uh, informed decisions in terms of like, you know, what would be some policies and recommendations that you can do uh, to make our community better or strive better. And like with the game project, one of the things we found out was, you know, <clears throat> where I taught, there weren't that many after school programs. Uh, there weren't that many uh, opportunities for students to get engage in like activities. And so a lot of times the gang became the after school club. And what I want to stress is that a vast majority of people who are in gangs aren't committing violent crimes. I and mean, they're putting uh, a lot of them through our research. We're just hanging out uh, using the gang as a social network. And so you mm -hmm. had gang members hooking up other gang members with jobs, like uh, I would say legal jobs. Um, and so what we, what we ended up talking about is like we presented our stuff at UCLA and um, not to say that somebody at UCLA is going to take it and run with it, but again, it provided them an opportunity to like showcase their work. And hopefully, you know, someone at UCLA who does have power can talk about the need to have more school programs or outreach programs for youth in general. Um, I mean, there's a big difference between South Central LA and just Inglewood, which is like uh, a mile away. Like Inglewood has all these new businesses that popped up and it basically looks, um, they had this one shopping area that looks like something you find in the suburbs. But if you go to South Central, there aren't any uh, major grocery stores. And you know, how does that affect us? Where you, know, you can't even buy a fresh vegetable. I mean, it's easier to buy a gun than a, a fresh tomato. And so how does that impact us? Um, so that's the type of work I did uh, with youth in terms of like showing them that they could be advocates for their own community and like reaching out to their community and reaching out to their parents and um, and doing that work. And so our conversation was, you know, in restorative justice is usually a party that's committed a crime or that's, that's committed a, uh, some type of harm and a party that's received that harm and wants a way to uh, articulate their hurt, uh, their pain. Um, and again, through these circles or forums, um, yeah, circles, conferences, uh, et cetera, 
discuss uh, how it's impacted us. And so what I did was I, I, I talked about, well, think about you as a teacher, like a, as you're in the classroom, right? Even though you might not have committed a crime or committed a, a harm, you know, what type of harms have already been, uh, what type of harms have existed in this community, right? And because these harms have existed, how does it impact how students behave, how families behave, um, how community members behave? And right. so a, a lot of the talk was like shifting it from a deficit perspective of blaming the community, blaming the family, blaming the kids for the behavior. Uh, it was shifting it to like, well, what, how can I use the harm that's uh, been done as a tool for transformation. Like one of my favorite authors is Bell Hooks, and he always talks about um, how pain can lead to transformation and pain can lead to healing. And I think that's one of the big um, ideas that I would like to see in education, which is how do we use pain? Uh, you know, the, the, the slides that you have right now, you know, the Trayvon Martin, uh, Alicia McBride, John Jordan Davis, Emmett Till, like how do we use that pain, that community pain? as a way to transform healing and uh, actually make changes? I think that's an excellent question. Um, and again, it is not out of the pre preview of restorative justice to look into that. And when we think about the tools that you, yourself and Nakima have shed light on, so this idea of um, professionals, educators, of, again, answering that call of Michelle Alexander to intersect, so cross over into another area and be able to um, aid the community in raising their voices in a way that brings about transformative change that's sustainable um, and that can answer. And so this idea of a truth and reconciliation um, conference, we have kind of seen those budding in Mississippi. We've seen them budding in Greensboro. Um, in North Carolina, um, but really trying to figure out how we can catapult that type of process um, so that we can touch the communities that are so heavily impacted, and even the subcultures and subgroups within those communities that are impacted um, even more significantly. Um, and then this idea of restorative justice being um, an alternative approach, the discipline approach in schools, so yeah, we see it in Minnesota, we see it in uh, Oakland, California, we see it brewing and revving up in Nashville, Tennessee, um, and other communities across the nation. But then really how can we take the, that momentum and take it to the next level where as we're working with community, we're pulling out a, another circle, an inner circle, that then takes it up to a systemic level to be able to address the harms that have been caused systemically. So in these last couple of minutes, do you guys want to speak on that? Well, Ideas that you may have? I think the time is now uh, to be able to put forth a restorative justice framework, even in response to President Obama's call to school districts to voluntarily revise their disciplinary policies. Um, so I think if the restorative justice community can come together and really um, develop that framework or at least articulate that framework, um, I think that there might be schools and districts around the country that are interested in taking a different approach. The other thing that I've noticed um, in my work with restorative justice practitioners um, here in Minnesota is that there is often um, a depth of knowledge in terms of how to utilize restorative justice as a tool in general to restore harm in the community. But there is a dearth of um, knowledge at times and often a lack of comfort when you incorporate issues of racial justice. Mm -hmm. So what I would like to see is um, for restorative justice practitioners to really be willing to dive more deeply yeah. in talking about race and understanding this unreconciled racial history, because that will open up new ways of doing things, new ways of thinking and allow uh, restorative justice to really become the dominant model for how we address harm within our community and within our public schools. I really think there's a hunger for that to happen. Mm. The other door that would be open 
would be for young people to realize that if you're a young African-American male, 16 or 17 years old, you have what it takes to become a restorative justice practitioner within your school and within your community. So we need to become intentional about arming our young people with this knowledge, with these tools that we all have um, access to, and teach them how to be leaders using that restorative justice framework, because they have so much influence with their peers, and they have an understanding of of the new generation. So I I see it as a call to action, um, and one that we shouldn't shy away from, but that we should actually be willing to to run towards. Very well put. What do you say, she? Um, I'm, one of the things I did last week was I had a class um, with the boys club. Uh, they're fourth, fifth, grade boys. And all I did was I did a simple activity. I showed them like images of different men because uh, the purpose of the class was to tie in hip hop pedagogy with uh, issues of masculinity, and mm. one of the things that that boggled myself, and uh, I have a student that's helping me out, was uh, we just showed an image of a black, a young black man, uh, with his cap on um, backwards, and all you can see is just like him wearing a black shirt and a cap on um, backwards, and uh, some of the kids were like, oh, you can tell that he's in the game, and that he's up to no good just by the way he's looking. And what I'm reminded constantly is um, how do we reframe these conversations, right? Mm -hmm. Um, How do we reframe how we view other folks? And this is where I I feel restorative justice can uh, come in handy, is given folks who are oppressed, who have been victimized, uh, who are constantly under target, you know, both literally and uh, figuratively as well, an opportunity to let their voices be heard. Um, uh, like what uh, Akima was saying, you know, she talks about the uh, story of justice giving young folks opportunity to lead. Um, mm. I would talk about how, you know, youth, part- youth participatory action research uh, gives young students the opportunity to lead as well. Um, when I was at UCLA, you know, I was part of this group called IDEA, and every year, I mean, every summer, we invited folks from uh, throughout Los Angeles high school kids to engage in uh, research. And every year, um, we went to City Hall and we presented our ideas to City Hall. And so, like, what was so powerful about that was so many kids uh, who didn't think they could graduate high school were all of a sudden turned on by school all of a sudden mm. felt empowered. And I think at the end of the day, that's what we need for. Like, how do we empower our kids and restore the George justice is one mechanism to do that. I agree. Um, and so I guess uh, we're looking at question and answer time coming up soon. So just to tie it all in, Restorative justice in my vision and what I've heard you all um, help illustrate um, in this webinar is that restorative justice can be that answer to Michelle Alexander's call to intersect. So it can be used as an approach, as processes to help us intersect um, education to criminal justice, to law, education to health, education to social um, community impact and social organizing. And that restorative justice as a process and, and, and approaches, but also, I would argue, as a theory-based mechanism, can begin to be in conversation with other theories like critical race theory, critical justice, critical law theory, um, and other social uh, science um, theories um, and approaches of practices of research. Um, to really, as you say, not only bring some more voices to the table that have not uh, we have not made room for, and as well as shed some light on things that are going on in the community um, that may not have been researched in a way that is helpful uh, and beneficial. Absolutely. And if you go into the prisons, so I've participated in restorative justice circles within the prisons, you see that 
people who are incarcerated are hungry for an opportunity to share their perspectives, to talk about the underlying hurt that may have led to harm that they caused in the community um, and shed tears in the process of being restored. So I see it as a very powerful tool. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so this challenge then I'm hearing also is a challenge to um, equip restorative justice practitioners um, with the tools to be able to, as you said, the team to dig a little deeper, so unearth um, the underlying and sometimes issues that are undergirding what the harm that they're in the circle to discuss is there um, in the first place. And also that restorative justice become um, more social. And what I mean by that is restorative justice begin to go into other disciplines and see ways in which uh, the approaches can be utilized within uh, the disciplines, social science disciplines, health science disciplines, law, um, and most definitely education. Um, and the ways in which educational research is conducted and the ways that we are, are dealing with discipline and even when we look at reform and how those conversations come to the table, it's always supposed to be community participation when we talk about educational reform, but is it really genuine participation? Right. Whereas restorative justice can ensure that um, the conversation is genuine and the participation is genuine. Right. And if you have practitioners that understand those underlying issues, they can help redirect the conversation, reframe issues, and help take the conversation a lot deeper than it would otherwise go. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, Howard, are we now at question answer time or do we have so, a few more minutes? It sounds like we are at a good point for some questions and answers. So why don't we go into that and then we may have a little bit of time at the end for wrap up comments. Um, the, each of you have, have raised some questions for the, for listeners. Uh, it sounds to me like you're pretty optimistic about restorative justice, but you're calling for the more inclusive versions, dialogue based mm -hmm. uh, versions of it. You're asking practitioners to engage with issues of race and privilege and with other theoretical areas um, you're um, you're asking for more, more open to more voices and so forth um, but let me go to these questions and then i may have a question or two too but, but let me go to the questions uh -oh. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> uh, you know don't you uh, okay one of the questions that came in is uh, about law enforcement the one problem i've noticed is the attitude of law enforcement which is unnecessarily hostile and abrasive and have often colluded with privileged groups. How can we reduce the hostility and tendency to see that threat everywhere? So this is, I don't know which of you wants to pick up on that one, but how do we address the issue of the law enforcement issue? Well, that's definitely a tough question. I think it's the million dollar question. But what I can tell you is that um, in Minnesota, we had an issue um, in, in St. Paul, Minnesota, in which, um, law enforcement were using um, this tool called obstructing legal process um, as a way of arresting people who really hadn't committed an offense. So if an officer was arresting someone and a person approached that officer and said, why are you arresting so-and-so? That officer would then arrest the person who asked the question. We thought that that was unacceptable, so we approached the city attorney within St. Paul about our concerns. And out of that, um, the city attorney actually had a conversation with the chief of police about changing their practices. The city attorney's office actually wound up retraining all of their attorneys so that they would no longer serve as a rubber stamp on those arrests that were unjustified. And then the other thing that we incorporated was a restorative justice component. So in other words, in situations in which the city attorney felt that the initial arrest was a just arrest, that person would have an opportunity to participate in a restorative justice circle that would include the officer or a representative on behalf of that officer, a community representative, which we often played that role, the person who was arrested, um, as well as um, another stakeholder or two if it was appropriate. 
And so that person who was arrested would have an opportunity to express why they may have, you know, gotten upset with an officer or, you know, um, resisted arrest or whatever the issue was. And then the officer was able to explain their line of thinking in the situation in terms of did a crowd gather? Had the officer been working a, you know, 12 hour shift and was stressed out? So we had opportunities for dialogue through restorative justice. And the officers, in most cases, walked away feeling as though they had a better understanding of issue affecting the African-American community. So that was one example. Um, but I think the main thing is persistence, having a strategy and community support anytime you're dealing with challenging law enforcement practices and policies. If I could add yeah. uh, changes to some of the policies. Uh, when Stop and Frisk was uh, executed in New York City, uh, you know, one of the police officers uh, actually shed light on some of the advice or trainings that he was receiving uh, when conducting Stop and Frisk, which was basically racial profile. And so if we keep having these uh, policies such as Stop and Frisk and other policies that promote the idea that only black and brown youth um, or maybe just youth in general are up to no good, well, that's going to affect how they perceive youth, uh, especially black and brown youth. Uh, another thing would be, um, you know, help, helping officers be aware of their implicit biases. Again, like there's so much research that's been done uh, with simulations um, with police officers and shooting, um, again, black males, especially. Uh, even when they're not caring, uh, even when they don't have anything harmful, um, they're constantly being targeted. At. So having them aware of that and maybe uh, going through different exercises where they can uh, be more reflective on how they view the community. I also think like, uh, you know, community policing was supposed to be the, the solution to gathering uh, and, and having officers and community folks uh, be more cohesive. But again, if, I, if I'm a community officer and I have negative perceptions about this community that I'm working in, then that's not going to help me. It's just going to reinforce the negativity that I'm constantly looking for. So I think a lot of it has to do with just self awareness and changing policy. Yeah. Yeah. You want to say more on that? No, no, no. I just wanted to tie it into, again, the pioneer issue for restorative justice being one where restorative justice practitioners and scholars are really in conversation with education and legal policy. Absolutely. And I think the other piece is, again, it goes back to making sure that restorative justice practitioners are comfortable dealing with issues at the intersection of race and poverty or the intersection of racial conflict related to uh, law enforcement. Because when we first launched the project that I just referenced, we had to do some educating of the justice practitioners to get their comfort level um, up to par so that they could effectively lead those circles. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a huge issue. Well, the questions are pouring in here, <laughs> which is good. Uh, there's one that, that's been going to all the panelists, and I'll get to that, but there's a couple here that Sarah has grouped under systemic issues. So the first one is someone that's saying they'd like to hear more about, Jacqueline, you mentioned a case story, a study about a focus group coming out of a restorative justice process that's focused on addressing systemic issues. Is there more you could say about that? Yeah, absolutely. So we had this gathering of African-American restorative justice practitioners or folks who were doing the work and considered the work that they were doing in line with um, the principles and philosophies of restorative justice. And out of that group, I think it was probably about um, nine or 10 of us um, in the team that can correct me if I'm mistaken, but they, they had spearheaded from that 2009 um, issues where we have um, Folks that are taking restorative justice and looking at uh, the price of working with healthcare providers to look at this crisis of lead paint and how lead paint is 
impacting academic achievement, but we've had this issue of lead paint being um, a social and economic um, inequity issue. Um, and so then really utilizing um, restorative justice to bring those stories to the table. Um, we have practitioners who have taken restorative justice into schools in a way that, yeah, we take it into schools and we have a circle processing, but also taking it into schools in a way that um, allows practitioners in the school to be able to identify the language. So I talk about, um, you know, when you're in restorative, in the circle process, the practitioner is listening. They're listening for the stories. They're listening to the voices in the circle. But we also have to be able to listen to the voice of the system. So we need to know what the system is saying and how it is impacting uh, whatever issue that is going on in the school at the time. So, yeah, I think that good things have happened. It looks like, I always say it's like we're a snail on the ocean floor, but I think, you know, uh, overall, we're making some impact. Well, that actually connects to the next question. She said, our program in Maryland is fairly well integrated into the juvenile justice system. We get many referrals, and restorative justice is offered as a diversionary option pre-adjudication. However, I can't help but feel that we are simply providing a Band-Aid to the larger racist system. The number mm. of referrals, and it's a huge percentage from schools to fight, has not been reduced, mm -hmm. and those don't get referred to us end up with a record. How can we lever leverage our position to make more systemic change? You could do a whole webinar on that one, couldn't we? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That is that's webinar part two. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll start it, and then please, Shiva and Nakima, jump in. But that is a powerful question, and that's what we're saying is that um, restorative justice must be able to have the impact to not just have circles within, you know, where we're dealing with the actual harm, but it, it must be able to look at what's going on systemically and take the approach and the processes to the system to the board level. So again, practitioners being able to look at board policy, um, to be able to identify what's going on in the school, to work with educational leaders. So we're really seeing that as huge because educational leaders are in such a difficult position right now with the way educational reform um, has become um, guided or driven by this neoliberalism agenda that um, they're really just in there as corporate managers. So they're not really able to listen to um, the issues that are impacting the greater community. So being able to bring that greater community into the school, um, I think it's going to be a big help. But getting the community there, again, means that we have to be able to take restorative justice on the ground in the community and identify uh, leaders who have that energy of readiness. And that can be um, champions for restorative justice approaches. Yeah, I would agree completely with what you just said. I mean, what I'm hearing from that question um, is the fact that the person is seeing patterns um, and practices that maybe aren't as consistent with with the principles of restorative justice. And in those opportunities, sometimes your hands are tied, especially if you're working with stakeholders in the system. But that's why having community partners are so important, because if you can bring your concerns to those partners, if, for example, your, your stakeholders within the system aren't willing to listen. If you're connected to community-based organizations or grassroots organizations and you say, here's what I'm seeing that are the problems and here are opportunities to advocate for change, that could be a really important partnership that, that a restorative justice practitioner can leverage to bring about change possibly in a roundabout way. It isn't always direct, depending on your relationship with the system. But if you're willing to take that risk of, you know, um, of sharing what you see, um, I think some good results can come out of that that would actually help to shift that paradigm. But there is an element of risk taking and vulnerability that can be involved in that as well. Just to piggyback off of that, I would say uh, action research uh, inquiry. If this is mm -hmm. at a school, then and I'm not sure what this posi uh, position of this uh, attendee is, but if you, even if you're not a teacher, but a uh, person who's involved in the school, you know, don't be afraid to gather the research mm -hmm. and showcase that research to the principal mm -hmm. um, and to the school. Um, but then it, it also goes back 
to the idea of like you know how our teacher is viewing students and uh, I didn't mention this earlier but you know over 80 percent of the teachers are white um, and, and a lot of them come from this general demographic and I don't mean to essentialize but the research has shown that they come from middle class backgrounds most of them are female uh, most of them come from suburbs and so if you have this background and you're teaching it um, in an urban area or even if you're teaching at a suburban area and the demographics have changed and it's not what it was like when you were there um, you're going to have different attitudes um, and also making sure that teachers are aware of, you know, are they aware that they're implementing different forms of discipline to different to the kids you know over the research has shown over consistently that if a student of color and a white uh, student commit the same infraction the student of color always gets the harsher infraction so that's absolutely <laughs> including um students with disabilities right. um, or who are in special education they also suffer some of the worst punishment and it's worse for students of color who have disabilities or special education needs as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I would then tie in to say as a strategy for this practitioner, if this, if this attendee is a practitioner, is to begin to look at rallying a team. So when you're dealing with issues that you're utilizing the sort of justice as an approach, it, it is not going to be enough for you to simply be the practitioner helping facilitate a discussion of harm. It is going to require that you know who your community partners are on the ground, that you know who the leaders are who have access to the school building, that you know um, who your uh, allies are in schools of education and in law schools, so that as Nakima and she were saying, when you're ready to then compile what you know is going on, your tacit knowledge, and take that to the policy level, you have a community, a group of people with you um, to make that happen. Absolutely. Um, most people are surprised by this, but schools are highly politicized environments. So you, that's why you <laughs> so allies and, and community stakeholders. So don't be naive about that. Recognize that it's definitely going to take some some strategic thinking and alignment um, in order to make change happen. Absolutely. But it's worth it at the end of the day. Yes, it is. And it, and it creates, in my opinion, sustainable change, which is what we're looking for. Not change is going to be here today and gone tomorrow. Absolutely. Let me go to a, a slightly different question. There's still a couple about schools, and I'll come back to those as we have time. It's the one that's been posted here all panelists consider it has to do with well you've met a number of you have mentioned truth and reconciliation commissions and i've always been intrigued by that possibility but also the question of how you get those things going mm -hmm. given the political nature and all the resistance and so forth but here's a question considering specifically the most recent killing of a black teen jordan davis i'm interested to know how you think sort of justice and or truth and reconciliation could potentially be utilized within that community Clearly the, man, clearly, the man who killed him would not be a participant since he sees himself as a victim, so it would be powerful to try to reach him. How might the black and white community, leaders as well as ordinary residents, play roles in a restorative justice or truth and reconciliation effort? That's a mouthful. But <laughs> <laughs> anything you can say about that? If I can interject. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, this idea came to the three of us because, you know, again, over and over, um, all these cases have the same verdict. Like the perpetrator is always found not guilty. Um, I didn't mention this earlier, but when I first heard the Trayvon Martin case, I thought of Bernard Getz. Um, mm. I grew up in New Jersey, right outside of New York. And in 1984, uh, Bernard Getz was known as the subway vigilante. Right, and he shot four African American teens, um, two of them in the back. And again, like the verdict was not guilty. Like he just got, he was found guilty of uh, illegal gun possession, but not of murder. And then uh, the slide you had earlier of Emmett Till, you know, six, took them six, seven minutes to find that the perpetrators were not guilty. And so 
even if we can't get satisfaction from the justice system, we need satisfaction somewhere where we feel like our voices are heard. And it's not so much to get justice as it's so much to talk about our pain and allowing this truth and reconciliation process to allow our truths, our stories to be told. And in telling our truths and our stories, let the healing process begin. Because what's occurring right now is we just we just uh, get reinforced over and over again these messages of, all right, you know, I have a, a son who's six years old, you know, I don't want to be having conversations with him that, you know, if you're uh, in a car with your friends at a gas station and some white guy tells you to turn it down, then you better do it. You know, I don't mm. want him, I don't want him to be oh, afraid to, be, to uh, yeah, like the hat he had all day. You know, I don't want him to be afraid to wear a hoodie uh, just to go to the store. Uh, and then, like, I constantly be out answering questions to people he, who he doesn't know. Uh, you know, I, I always taught that if you're if there's a stranger, you're not supposed to talk to them, right? So, like, why are we allowing strangers to dictate how our kids live their lives? Uh, and it's not so much just for the individual victim, it's, it's for the family, it's for the community. Because, like, we may know Trayvon, and we may know Jordan Davis, and we know Renisha McBride, uh, Amadou Diallo, Oscar mm. Grimm, Sean Bell. I'm not going to go on and on. But, like, these people, they live with us. You know, they're, they're not, uh, their trauma still lives with us and affects how I carry my manners outside of this office, right? So, like, I need to hear voices of other people in that community of, like, how this has affected them and how, how it impacts them. And I think that's what the truth and record do, reconciliation process is all about, um, allowing the eating to occur. Absolutely. And I will say that as a process, again, as a strategy, when we think about restorative justice and we think about practitioners, I'm going to go on both sides, the practitioner side and then the process with PRC. Um, on the practitioner side, when you enter into a process of restorative justice, what you know you must do is that you must be a prophetic listener. So you have to be able to listen to what's going on in that circle. And the main reason that you're wanting to listen prophetically is that you must identify the common thread in that circle. And not only just identify it so that you can help facilitate the process, but also identify the common thread or listen prophetically so that those in the circle learn something that they didn't and discover something that they didn't even know themselves. What I hear brewing underneath this Jordan Davis situation is the idea of mothers. So when we think about how would you bring a TRC together that would be less political than we've seen in the past, is this idea of what do all mothers, white and black, have in common with this Jordan Davis killing? And again, Restorative justice being such a powerful, old, indigenous practice is that we know that the elders um, in those practices always wanted to find the voices that had and find that common thread in those voices. And I think that to bring a conversation to the table and to call for a TRC, we're looking at the mothers, the women, perhaps bringing this um, issue to the table. And I'll raise the issue of uh, when the federal government was shut down. Okay, it was the women in Congress who took it, they took it to the head. You know what I mean? They said that we want to figure out how to circumvent um, what's going on. Uh, so, again, I think that the women will have the power in this and will have be able to figure out a common thread to then bring about a TRC to discuss the pain that, all mothers are going through. When we see Trayvon, we can't help but see our own sons because we know that it's only by the grace of God, as the old people would say, that your son is not um, in a grave right now because it's just a cha it's just a matter of chance. Absolutely. I mean, I would agree with what both of you just said. Um, I think one place to have this dialogue would be within the faith community. Yeah. Um, possibly as a starting point. Um, after the George Zimmerman verdict came out, 
um, I appeared on a radio station, a local CBS um, affiliate, and you would not believe the response that I received from callers who did not believe that Trayvon's death was connected to race at all. I mean, I was really, I was taken <laughs> aback um, by the responses of people who were so upset that I articulated that race was a factor in his death. So it showed me that the gulf between blacks and whites is very large in terms of thinking about these issues. And again, I'm generalizing here, but what we decided to do at my church was to hold a community forum. Um, and we focused specifically on the aftermath of the Zimmerman verdict and what does this mean about race relations in America? Mm-hmm. So, and that, and there was a multicultural crowd of people, whites, blacks, Latinos, I mean, it was a, a broad range of folks beginning to grapple with issues at the intersection of race, poverty, and identity. Um, so I think that restorative justice can play that type of a role mm-hmm. in terms of giving space for this type of dialogue, but also leading towards healing and allowing mm-hmm. people to air out their concerns um, and how there is an ever-present danger that one of our children will be next and helping to explain that to maybe a person who doesn't have to think about that. We have just a couple minutes left. Um, let me take, change a little bit, except one connected here, Jackson. Somebody's asking, did you mention a TRC in Mississippi? Is there one actually happening there or other restorative justice happening in Mississippi? Well, there it was brewing. So... I'm not quite sure if it's still brewing, if it's fizzled out, or but there were folks that were brought together to be in discussion about um, having that type of process in um, Mississippi. Uh, but again, the politics are always heavy, and I agree with Nakima. Um, the conversations that I'm having are with um, churches, black churches, who are already, again, that energy of readiness, they're already demonstrating that they have done things like have dialogues already um, and that they're willing to be the champion champion of an effort such as this. Okay, let me ask another specific question that someone's asking, and that is this person saying they'd like to open a conversation with the school board in Northern Kentucky about introducing mm-hmm. restorative justice practice. But how to, where to begin? The person saying, I don't know where to begin. Any suggestions about that? Could you repeat the last part of the question? The mic was any suggestions, any suggestions about how to start a dialogue with a school, a local school board, about introducing restorative practices in a school? Well, one of the things that's helpful is having some data. So, mm-hmm. for example, um, are there statistics in which they've broken down the number of suspensions, expulsions, administrative transfers, or arrests by race, for example, or even pre and reduced lunch? So data is powerful in terms of statistics, but also anecdotal evidence. So one of the things that one of our strategies, depending upon the circumstances, might be to hold a community town hall forum where you invite parents and children and um, community members to come to the table around an issue like school discipline so that you can gather information and stories and also to gauge their interest in possibly being allies with you if you're going to fight for change um, in the presence of the school board. Um, so those town hall forms are, are excellent ways to make sure that you have, you know, information to back up what it is you are requesting. So that, mm-hmm. that would be my, my primary recommendation. And sometimes we'll do data practices requests where you can send a letter to, let's say, the Department of Education or even the superintendent of a particular district and ask them for a breakdown of their suspensions, expulsions, et cetera. And then you use that data to uh, make recommendations for change. That makes sense. Do you, by the way, somebody's asking whether, where they can go for more research on students of color in the, in the educational system. Do you have any of that you can give us real quickly, or maybe you can just send us and we'll attach it to the link when we post this on our website? I can send a couple of links, but off the top of my head, I can tell you that UCLA published a uh, um, a study within the last year that was really powerful and broke down this information about the school to prison pipeline. And if they Google school to prison pipeline, tons of things will come up. 
There are also a number of YouTube videos that young people have put together about the pipeline as well. Uh, are, they, are they asking for scholars who are doing uh, school pipelines? Uh, no, they're just asking for systems for students of color in the system. So I don't know more than that. Okay. Uh, yeah, they one, can. Uh, one, uh, sorry, one article I would uh, encourage people to read is an article by uh, Jeff Duncan Andrade called a, a Note to Educators. Um, they talk about critical hope. And a lot of times the school talks about how we expose kids to false hope. <laughs> um, but that's a, a very good article to read. Just to, it doesn't necessarily talk about school prison pipeline, but just this idea of like mm -hmm. hope and what what it means to engage students in critical hope. Mm -hmm. And I would say just to look at some just data, this national data, they can always go to uh, the Department of Education (DOE) and the Office of Civil Rights publishes data on uh, all students who are in. Um, and just recently, they are required to as of 2011, I believe, to publish data on all students um, in schools, not just um, a sample study. And then the Pew Foundation uh, conducts research often, uh, as well as Casey um, will have some good information, and the Stout Foundation uh, as well. They specifically, though, they're looking at um, African-American male youth. Mm -hmm. The Children's Defense Fund as well is another yes. source. Yes. I see we're getting some links posted here, and that's good. We're about out of time, unfortunately. We have a couple more questions that, unfortunately, we're not going to get to, although most of them have been touched on. Uh, Jackson, do you have uh, any final comments to say before we start wrapping up here? Um, I would just really just like to give thanks, and thank you, Howard, for having this forum, for opening up the space, for being an amazing gatekeeper, for allowing this conversation to surface. Um, we do the work on the ground, but we always need that pipeline and those that are gatekeepers um, at systemic levels, at system levels, to allow us to bring that voice nationally. Um, so I'm very, very thankful for that. I'm very thankful to be surrounded by powerful folks like she and Nakima, um, who are voices that folks, you know, don't typically know because when, you, when you're grinding, you don't always know who these people are who are doing the work. So I'm very thankful to be um, aligned with them as well. And I want to thank the three of you for being willing to be on. We, we've just barely scratched the surface of what I think is this an absolutely <laughs> critical topic. So I hope we find more forums where we can continue the conversation. So thank you. Thank I'm, you. Going to, I'm going to turn it over now to Fabrice Derrier, our graduate assistant, who's going to say a little bit about things coming up, and then I'll come back and say a, a final goodbye. So, Fabrice, are you ready to switch over here? Thank you very, very much. Uh, to tell you a little bit about myself, I'm a first year CJP student mm. and I'm the GA for the Zare Institute. And I'm very, very grateful to be helping out with this process. It's really been very impactful in my life. Uh, I was born and raised in Haiti, and some of the political, economic, and justice systemic issues there have definitely influenced my uh, life in the direction I've taken here at CJP for the master's program in conflict transformation. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the upcoming STEM webinars you definitely do not want to miss. We have March 19th, which is possibly your pipe dream, with Dana Green and Carl Stopper. And you also have uh, RG with Arts with Jane Golden. and on May 14th, Neuroscience and RJ with Cheryl Powell. So you definitely Woo! do not want to miss uh, those uh, <laughs> webinars. Uh, some of the Summer Peace Building Institute uh, classes are going to be offered. Jacqueline will be back with us in uh, Harrisonburg to teach with Carl the impact of social is issues on restorative justice. And Carl Stoffer will also be teaching for SBI class, Restorative Justice, The Promise, The Challenge. So definitely make sure to spread the word and, and those are going to be very dynamic classes to attend. And one of those, uh, also, also one thing we offer is the Strategic uh, for Trauma Awareness and Resilience, which is a, a phenomenal training that digs deeper into the collective traumas and the personal traumas and how do you, as a practitioner, address those issues more closely. You become more aware of those things because 
a lot of practitioners as RJ practitioners, we, we're facing those uh, traumas in our practice. And I'm part of the Masters in Conflict Transformation. Also, this is a very practice oriented. That's one of the reasons I also came here to the program. You really get to bridge that gap between theory and practice. So I would definitely recommend you guys looking at uh, Conflict Transformation at uh, CJP. And we focus on RJ, psychological trauma, strategic peace building, organizational leadership, and many uh, unique specializations. And I want to thank you very, very much. Uh, this has definitely been a dynamic conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, do come back for future ones. And we're going to be also looking at other forums where we can have these kind of conversations in virtual space. Uh, I've got we've got a number of ideas for expanding these conversational forums in the future. So if you would like to be kept in touch, then I think we have a place online you can sign up and uh, to be notified when we have things coming up. So thank you again. I hope everyone has a good evening and thank you to our guests especially for for sharing their time and thoughts with us today. So good evening to all and thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.